this is the first time I'm presenting at one of these conferences. And I tend to always, at the previous times that I've attended these, I have tend to leave with two questions. Number one, how does this technology fit into my current service delivery? And number two, how do I convince my budget holders and my finance team to invest in this technology? So today, I was hoping to set the scene a little bit, build a case for change, followed by a case study of how we implemented an Imperial, some challenges that we faced, as well as some benefits that we're seeing already. So let's start by setting the scene and building the case for change, because as most of us will know, without that case for change, the finance team will not buy it. Right? And we need to be solid about why the technology is required in our hospitals. So to understand the challenges we face at the moment, we kind of need to first understand how we got to this point to begin with. And we need to really think back years ago to pre-pandemic, before everything went a little bit south. So there's been a common thread in all our lives in the last few years. And no matter how we've come out on the other end of the pandemic, it's changed the way that we are. Healthcare is a people's business. So naturally, that means that the way that we present healthcare, the, the way that we deliver healthcare, needed to change alongside it. Even before the pandemic in 2016, there were workforce challenges that we faced. And one of the quotes that I really like from the report is this one. If we care about the NHS, we need to care about its people too. And in challenging times, it's people in the, in the, in the NHS who will improve the quality and increase productivity, no one else. That was in 2016. At that stage, we had 4 million people on the waiting list in England alone waiting for treatment. That really frames what I'm going to present to you today. That actually, it's the people that will implement this technology, and it's the people who will need to buy into this technology. Now, if we fast forward a few years into the pandemic, and I'm sure most of us in this room and at home will have a had at least some experience with dealing with patients during the pandemic, it was a challenging time. We all had to front up, but the public perception and the general mood of the public was high for healthcare workers. We were the frontline workers, we were the key workers, we even got claps every week. Unfortunately, even at that time, it was very apparent that the waiting list was growing. There was, there was something on, going on in the background that is causing us a bit of anxiety. So the waiting list is both a visible one, you know, the cancellation of appointments because of COVID, the reduction of services that we had, but there was also a hidden waiting list. These are the patients who haven't come forward for care yet. Now, as we emerged from the pandemic, it was very apparent that the challenge was still ahead of us for healthcare. The public perception and the policymakers then swung back heavily towards scrutinizing our activity levels as well as what we're doing in the hospitals. The latest figures of July 2023 shows that there's about 7.6 million people in England alone waiting for treatment. And somewhat importantly and quite shocking, the waiting time for treatment has ballooned out to 14 weeks, almost double that of pre-COVID times. That's not sustainable both for the patients, but also for the business of healthcare. This leads us all back to imaging, where in the last few years, because of the pandemic, it has really brought a sharp focus into the way that we review and deliver our diagnostic services to our patients. We know that the challenges are out there. The mind exceeds capacity. There's financial restraints in the system where we can't get the scanners that we need to improve the capacity. We have workforce issues. The workforce is shrinking, they're tired, and they're stretched far too thin. This is where we will build our case for change and establish that. There are already national priorities that are attempting to tackle these challenges, the CDC program being one of them. But probably more important for us today is the national transformation program, a national imaging transformation program. And one key line there is that we have incentive to be an early adopter of this new technology. One such example is using AI in technology, or in healthcare. 
When we talk about AI in healthcare, it generally fits into three categories. Now, I don't know whether I'm allowed to actually tell the product name, so I won't go down that path, but it could be patient-oriented, where we're using videos, audios, data to understand the connection between patient and disease. It be, could be clinical or clinician-oriented, things like using AI to identify the lumps and bumps that Professor Wadi was talking about. And it could be operational, things like using AI to generate discharge summaries, which is a pilot that we're trialing at Imperial at the moment. Today, I want us to focus on ARDL. So that's the new technology that's been um, implemented here. And that fits kind of nicely between clinician as well as operational. So at Imperial, we face the same problems that most of us are facing. So just to reiterate, the demand exceeds capacity, the workforce is stretched far too thin, and probably uniquely to the London hospitals, we have limited estate space. So even if we were throwing money, there's no way to put new scanners. So we ended up doing a bit of an operation, uh, options appraisal. Option one, do nothing. Can we continue treading water and seeing where we go? Obviously not an ideal proposition. Option two, review our current pathways to see whether we could eke out any more efficiencies with our service. So the service managers in the crowd today at, at, and online would probably recognize these headings, protocol standardization, review of appointment times, workforce modeling, upskilling and training of staff. Now, when we talk about technology and AI, actually, believe it or not, a lot, a lot of the technology have already been implemented into our systems. So things like review of appointment times, our business intelligence team do a lot of work around telling us how quickly we scan how many patients extra we can scan if we scan a little bit quicker, how many DNAs we have. So that's already in there. Workforce modeling, the NHS has published many, many, many workforce models that you could access online that could tell you how many, how many red offers you need per scanner. The upskilling and training of staff at Imperial, we've adopted the virtual support technology pilot where we're remotely observing, supervising, scanning patients across the three sites. So there's already things that are going on. So that's option two, review what we have done to eke out any more efficiencies. But eventually it boils down to one thing, reduce your scan time. Now I'm not a physicist nor an expert in AI, so I'm not gonna go too much into detail about this one, but essentially it suffice to say that with AI, with ARDL, we're able to unlock the scan time with the resolution and the SNR. So we're no longer dependent on one over the other. And skip through that one because that is outside my expertise. So what do we do at Imperial? So let's talk a little bit about the installation. So AI, uh, ARDL or accelerated technology was pushed by the NHS Digital last year. And as all things in the NHS, we got the green light and it was go, 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 go. So the installation actually happened a week before Christmas. And I look around and I see a few of the internal people working over here, and we remember the pain of that installation. It took two days on our artists, followed by three days of app support, and then three months of optimization. And I think one of the questions was about how long it took to optimize. So we gave ourselves a three month window where we had to play, see what it was like. The expectation was that by go live, we were gonna scan 10 to 15 more or there was a 10 to 15% time savings for neuro exams, which equated to about two patients a day. Obviously, we had the stakeholders involved, the radiologists, the radiologists, the application support, the medical physicists. I didn't put in the patient, but the patients were also the stakeholders. Special shout out to the medical physics team because they were the ones who provided us the framework for the ethics approval for protocol optimization, which really streamlined things for us. So a little bit about how we approached it, as well as whether it's feasible for your services. I must say that the protocols remain the same with installation, because that was one of my biggest queries. Would they wipe my library? Would I need to build a protocol from scratch? Would it be compatible? It was compatible. You could run the list as you would, even before the installation. All ARDL does is this little button, let's see if this works, on the parameter screen that have four options. You could turn it off, 
You could have low, you could have medium, and you could have high. One of the first images that we produced for the radiologists was that ARDL almost worked too well. The images that we got back were so signal intense that they said, ooh, it's, it's, it's too smooth, we don't like that. We like the noise, we like that resolution coming back. So we thought, well, actually, how can we optimize it then? How can we make the images a little bit better? So we optimized through these five parameters, the number of excitations, the slice thickness, the acceleration factors, the matrix, and the bandwidth. So if we start by looking at the medium uh, and high. I didn't put a low one in there because we actually t didn't end up even using low as an option. And I didn't put an off uh, original in there because it will just be all grainy noise for you. So this is a low versus uh, a medium versus a high. So on the left hand side, you will see a, you will see a medium picture and a right hand side, you'll see a high picture. So what that shows is that even without changing any parameters, just by simply clicking that button, you will improve your signal to noise dramatically. Now I'm not a radiologist, but I will say either images were perfect for me. Then we thought about, let's see what we could do with playing around the matrix, the next, and the acceleration factors. So image number one shows our original image, and image number two shows our ARDL image. Number three, I want to talk a little bit about, because that's actually quite important for me. So with ARDL, you can turn on a button that says, I want the original picture. So if your radar just says, oh, I'm not sure whether this is real or not, you could turn it off, acquire the sequence, and you'll have two copies. So that's actually quite an ideal solution for us. But if we go back to the clinical picture, so picture number one, two minutes, pretty happy. We said, you know what, that's our standard protocol. Image number two was our optimized one. And I would say optimized with a bit of hesitation because that's not our final product. That was our final product before we broke for Christmas. We said, you know what, we saved 15 seconds, we increased the resolution a little bit, great, tick. Unfortunately, I met with, or fortunately I suppose, I met with a few of my senior team and said, you know what, this isn't the step change that we wanted. This isn't the change in direction that we thought that AI can produce for us. So we went back to the drawing board after Christmas. We said, let's see whether we could break it. Not physically. But let's see whether we could push the boundaries so far that AI doesn't work anymore, so that we could at least say, well, that's as far as we could go. So image number one is the pre-Christmas uh, optimized image. Image number two, we then decided to say, let's up the resolution a little bit. Still quite signal rich, because whenever we talk about resolution, we talk, ooh, does it drop the signal? Does the arc and asset artifact come back into play? But actually, no, quite signal rich. So we thought, let's push it even further. We increased the resolution and turned on ZIP 1024. Now, I'm sure someone in the crowd will be able to tell me a little bit more about ZIP 1024. But essentially, from what I understand, it's to display the uh, matrix size in a 1024 by 1024, and we're extrapolating data upwards. With doing that, we often lose signal to noise. But again, as you can see on image three, there's quite signal rich. We could still play around with that a bit more. And so we did. So we upped the resolution even further and said, well, does it break it? Again, number four, still quite signal rich. Went again, number five. We even dropped the number of the excitation. We thought, ooh, let's see whether we can make this quicker. And once again, the ARDL has worked on that occasion. And we settled on number six, which if I show you the next slide, is a perfect example of Number one being the original pre-Christmas, and number six being the final optimized product. Now, the Im image difference are subtle, I must say. They are subtle. But what was important for me was that the neuroradiologist told me, did you take that on a 3T scanner? And that is amazing for music to my ears. <laughs> okay. More important to show you on this one, really, is that with ARDL, the ringing artifacts that you often get on a T2 image is completely gone. It's cleaned it up completely. So the end result, what did our images look like before ARDL, and what did we look like when we've got it optimized? And you can see the difference is enormous.
Now, I know Prof has talked a little bit about this, so we're going to do a bit of a tag team. I want to focus on the people. I want to focus on the service. I want to focus on how we get this into play. So one of the first things when I write a business case or a business report is to define what quality is and how do we measure it. Because it's great for me to say, look, the radio just are all happy. Look how much signal we're getting out of it. Look how much quality we're getting out of it. But my fi finance people partner will say, what does that mean for me? Can you save any time? Can you actually save, can you create any pathways? So we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, so great. Let's see what we could do. Qualitative terms are the only thing that we could get our finance people to agree on. It's qualitative terms. So we've established five different pathways or services. So we've reduced the scan time, we've established different pathways, and we've improved the rate of experience. So I won't go through this um, too much, but if we look at these pictures, we could say that in our Explorer, we were able to reduce the scan time by about half on all the routine scans. Now we could have an argument about the quality, and I will put my hand up and say, obviously the quality of AI Dell is better. But again, it wasn't a very big selling point for our managers. It was good to have, not a must have. So what did we do? We then looked at our demand and activity. Now I will say, it is quite brave for me to present this, especially at this time of the year when we're looking at activity and we're scrutinizing it. But what I will say is that our activity have matched and exceeded what our pre-pandemic activity was. Now it's not particularly uh, impressive. Key things to note were that our installation knocked off a few days in December, February, and March. And I attribute the May drop to the bank holiday or the extra bank holiday. Um, but if we look at just the scanners that had the installation, that's when we see a little bit more um, a little bit more difference. So it becomes apparent that with the three scanners we've had the upgrades, you could see that we're averaging on about 5% increase of activity. And this is just through optimization of the neuro protocols. We still have a huge deal to do with the MSK, as well as the gyne, as well as the body work. So just really from neuro work, we've seen that improvement. Now, the claustrophobic pathway, the time is impressive, but what is more important for me is the service to the patient. So we know that across the board, the open MRI service is winding down. You struggle to find an open MRI anywhere in London now. Equally, the oral sedation pathway isn't exactly right. So oral sedation, as you, as you may be aware, is often hit and miss. You have GPs prescribing, you have placebo effects, you have hospitals who will prescribe, but then you only run three patients in the afternoon. So the oral sedation pathway isn't there qu quite there yet. We have wide bore scanners, but that only helps a very small portion of our population. So with the new ARDL, we could push the speed of the scan without reducing the quality. So here you could see an example or um, a comparison of the two where even with a one and a half minute scan, you're able to get a diagnostic quality scan. And this is where I think makes the biggest difference for our radiographers. When our radiographers are presented with a claustrophobic patient, they often need to decide between, should I get them on the table? Should I try to get something? If I get a blurry image, would the radiologist come back to me and say, it's a suboptimal image? Would it mean that the patient will have to come back? We've actually been using ARDL to remove that dilemma for the radiographers. So it makes their experience a lot nicer. They can help take a patient through the scan within six minutes and get some quality images for them. This is also the get it right first time. So as Wadi alluded to, the get it right first time pathway, we're one of the early adopters of it. It is a bit tricky because essentially what it says is that no matter what hour of the night, you will need someone to say that there is or isn't quarter All right. We run a 24 hour service and our MRI service is covered by specific trained neuro radiographers. What that means is we are putting pressure on them at 3 a.m to say, does this patient have cord equina? If they don't, you need to do another SAGE T2 of the whole spine. And I didn't think that was fair. 
Can the radiologist do that? The radiologists, we often only have one covering the nights, and they cover x-rays, CT, emergency, MRI. Is it fair for them to drop everything to come down to MRI to review the patient to see whether they need that extra scan or not? That poses a big dilemma for us. But actually, with ARDL, we're able to routinely just run it for every single patient without impacting on the scan time. So it just means that the radiographer, again, does not need to be put in a position where at 3 a.m. they could make a mistake that affects the quality of the patients that they provide for. So just to reiterate, that whole ARDL can be done ideally in 10 minutes. But if we need it quicker, we could do it in about seven and a half minutes. So that's important, especially with the patients who roll around off your table. Okay? We want to make sure we get at least some scanning done for them. And one of my biggest surprises for ARDL is extending the time that we have with our explorers. Now, what he was telling me about um, banging on about replacing the explorers, and I think we could all agree, especially from my team, I've been a big advocate of replacing those scanners. We've had an uplift, which is great, which is absolutely great, but it wasn't the step change that we needed. It wasn't the wow factor. And I was very open and honest with everyone who asked me about the quality of the scans coming from it. I said, you know what, it, it's fine, but it certainly doesn't concentrate for me an upgrade. It was getting it back to a level where it was acceptable clinically. But suddenly, with this new technology, we're able to produce images that I didn't think was possible. You could see, the qual you could see that the slice thickness, we could even reduce down to 2.5 for about 50 slices, and it was still un under four minutes. So these are the sort of things that we were able to achieve with the new technology via the explorers. And that, to me, is the step change that we needed to see, and that, to me, is the exciting thing about ARDL. The last thing is about the red offers, okay? So obviously, no matter what technology we throw at people, if they don't, if they don't feel up to it, we're not gonna get the outcome. One of the first questions they asked me, which is a very fair question, is how do you expect me to do two more patients a day? And I, <laughs> yeah, I can see a few nods in the crowd. How do you expect to do two more patients a day? But actually, we turned it around a little bit. Because we do, we're an emergency service, we have inpatient slots. We have a lot of inpatient slots, and we have a lot of inpatients. What we've done with ARDL is that we're able to squeeze inpatients in between our book slots so that the pressure is not on the red offers to, to say, oh, yes, bring the quarter quarterpiner down straight away, or no, you have to wait three hours for our next inpatient slot. That clinical risk is gone. We could just bring them down and squeeze them in, in between the patients. So some of the comments that the red offers have made for me is, ARDL takes the pressure off us when there's an emergency patient coming onto the scanner, because they know they will catch up. It makes so much difference to the claustrophobic pathway as well as the confused patient pathway. And using ARDL is actually quite quick and easy, and the impact is so noticeable that, honestly, a lot of my presentation today isn't even about the quality, because I think the image quality sells itself. What we need to sell is how we could use that image quality to change the way we deliver care. So these are the things that I've put into the business case around trying to get more technology. But the last thing I will say is that I want to wrap back up to our case for change. So we have the potential to use this technology to really help our patients and as well as our staff. We shouldn't be worried about AI and we should definitely be embracing the chance to use new technology for our patients. Certainly when I need a scan in 20, 30 years time, I'd be very disappointed if AI, ARDL or its next iteration isn't available for me. Thank you very much.